All right, so it's wonderful, really good to be back home. And for a quick thought today, I know for exhortation, generally, uh, Sam's has been read here and we stand together and read Sam's. Honestly, I did not prepare a Sam's today. And when I was reading and when Pastor put this thought in my head, I was wondering what is a good thing? And there is a lot in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament that I do not know of. And as I explore further and further, every story gets interesting. And how Pastor mentioned about how the Old Testament is a shadow of the New Testament. And everywhere we can see its connection one by one. So imagine the excitement when you find it out for yourself. Like, man, I saw that connection there. Which never happens. But Holy Spirit is helping us when you read the Bible. Holy Spirit is helping us guide through it and showing us that connection one by one. So that was one of the exciting moments where I picked the story of Naaman or Naaman. Many people pronounce it differently. How, how is it pronounced? I don't know. Is it Naaman? All right. I used to call it Naaman all these. Let's stick with Naaman, right? So Naaman, I'm sure the name Naaman, we have almost... Everybody has heard, but do we know the context, the story, especially the kids? Uh, Danny, Jonah, Nathan, uh, Mishu, Caleb, have you guys heard of Naaman? Never heard of Naaman? All right, so let me join your ranks too. Right? Even I, I have heard of the name Naaman, but I didn't know where in the Bible to find it. So let's all start. You ready with your Bible? Go ahead. Read for me there. Second Kings, chapter 5. Samu, if you are ready, you can also read. That's fine. Second Kings, chapter 5. Now, the whole chapter... Mm -hmm, go ahead. Read the whole chapter. It's going to be too long for you, Jonah. So, I'll skip that part and go directly into this one. The story is very straightforward. There was a great conqueror, actually the commander of, king, commander of the king of Israel, Sorry, Syria, king of Syria, commander of the king of Syria. And he was a really great conqueror. He was all over the place, wherever he went, he was victorious. He was able to capture a lot of different people. And one time when he was enslaving somebody, they attacked Israel. Now, Syria is different, Israel is different. One time they captured a small slave girl and he gave it to his wife. So she was a small girl as a slave to his wife. Now, Naaman is well known among all the people out there. Even in the whole land, he was really well known, right? When we sit here today, there are a lot of people who has a great family history. I mean, I can trace my roots back all the way to the first family that got converted in Kerala when St. Thomas landed there, right? So, all the way back. We all have great stories and great families and, you know... Is their prayers and blessing is what we are standing here. That is a message for a different day, not today. But Naaman also had a humongous background. He was really well known. He was not a king. He was a great commander there though. He had one flaw. And that one flaw was leprosy. Now, last week I wasn't here. A week before that, Sam very clearly painted a picture there, right? Leprosy doesn't look for what your social status is or what your condition is or anything like that. Anybody can catch leprosy. No matter what your background is, you can also have any kind of sicknesses. That makes us feel humble. Like, where do we stand? Nowhere. What are we? We might make a lot of money. We might have a lot, all these connections, commitments, running around all over the place, making all these different things, trying to be somebody in this world, and one sickness can put you down. Last week at one of my clients, I realized that the CFO, the great CFO, for a long, long time, all of a sudden I found out that he was terminated at the company. And I, I got surprised. Like, you know, he's been doing really good for a long time. There was personal reasons why he terminated. And not a single email sent out saying that such a great fellow is terminated in the company anymore. Probably he requested, like, don't let anybody know. Just keep it quiet or whatever. Right? But my point is, unexpectedly, one sickness can bring you down. No matter how much money, fame, what you are in this world, no matter how far widespread you are running, traveling, running around, bringing businesses, doesn't matter. One sickness, one small thing can make you humble, right? But Naaman wasn't humble. He was proud because he was a great conqueror. 
Then one day the slave girl tells him that, you know what, there is a great prophet in Israel. Go to him, he might be able to heal you. Right? And you know, what does a slave girl know? But anyway, the word that was shared pondered with him. We'll tell you, I'll, tell, I'll come back to the point what I'm trying to make here, right? The word was shared by a small slave girl to Naaman, saying that there's a great prophet in Israel. Um, God works wonders there, you can get healed there, right? He didn't really believe it, but still he went to his king and told him, okay, uh, this is what the slave girl is saying, you know what, I don't know what to do. And the king goes, you know what, check it out. Go ahead and check it out. You, you never know what happens, right? Let me, you know what, in fact, I know that guy who was the king of Syria. King of Syria was Ben Hadid and Naaman was his commander. So king of Syria said, I know that guy, let me give you a letter. Take this letter to the king of Israel and tell him to heal you. All right. So he, Naaman goes, packs all this stuff with him, goods, clothes, coins, all of these things and keep going. Once he reaches there, he hands over the letter to the king of uh, Israel and gives him and the king of Israel reads it and goes, um, what? Okay. So the king, as soon as the king of Israel reads the letter, he tore his robe and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. What happened? The king already got panicked and he was like, what's going on? Why is he trying to pick a fight with me? Why is he sending someone asking me? I'm just a king here. I'm not God asking me to heal someone. But what the king really forgot is there is a great prophet called as Elijah <coughs> in his kingdom who can do wonders and he didn't even think about it. Now, the point here is the slave girl remembered. The slave girl had the faith that God can do wonders. But the king who has everything, who commands over all the people there, didn't even think about such a great prophet is in his kingdom. Instead of what he did, he just panicked. Doesn't that happen with all of us also many a times? We have all the equipments that we need to fight this and we still won't remember that we have this in our pocket. We just go into panic mode, right? And this is a message to all the kids here, mainly, right? All this Sunday school preparation, Christmas celebration preparation, you can ask the question that why should I do it? Right? And, no, you guys do ask, why, why am I doing it? Why, why should we do it? When God gives you talent, you have it with you. Use it. Why are you afraid? I'm afraid of stage fear. I'm afraid of whatever, you know, different reasons different kids give. Don't be. When God is with you, why should you be afraid of it? Just go for it. Prepare. You never know who you are touching. You have no idea who all watches us on YouTube and... It might be that one person who is really sad looks at your face and say, Amen, if that kid can be joyful, if God can do such wonderful things, then why not? Right? People can be turned around. So, going on, moving on to it. The king had all he needed, but he didn't even think about Elijah. So, when he was going through panic mode, Elijah heard what's happening and Elijah sent a man to say, Okay, you know what, king, don't worry, send him to me. And then he goes to Elijah. When Naaman reaches there, Elijah didn't even bother to come out. Sorry, not Elijah, Elisha. My bad, Elisha. Elisha didn't even bother to come out. He was in his tent, he didn't even bother to come out, step outside. Instead, he, he wanted to help, so he just said the word, ask the king to go to River Jordan and wash himself seven times. That's it. You know, a very simple instruction. Ask the king to go to Jordan. Let him wash himself seven times. But Naaman is so powerful. He is like, okay, how does miracle uh, revival retreats and wonder miracle retreats and things like that happen here? Has any of you guys seen it? Even on TV at least? Praise the Lord. Big shout. Hallelujah. Right? People lame walk into the stage, big stages, big decoration, big banner advertisement, lot of people, thousands of people, you know, blind is seeing, lame is walking. Well, this miracle wasn't even like that. He just said the word, asked him to go to the river, Jordan, and dip himself seven times and come back out. There was no banner. But what was Naaman expecting? 
you know, I am such a big guy, Elijah is such a big prophet, there should be at least thousands of people witnessing a miracle, a cure, right? Cure of leprosy, nobody has even heard of it. Can this guy do it? I don't think so. But anyway, I'm going, I'm here right now. You might as well get a show out of it, right? Nothing, nothing. He didn't even come out. He just sent one guy and said, go take a dip. He got really angry. And he went back and said, no word, this guy doesn't even have the courtesy to come out. Uh, I'm going to go back. And his servants around him told him, you know, if the prophet has told you to do something, and if that do something is such a simple thing, just do it. What are you going to lose? Nothing, right? Naaman somehow listened to him. Naaman was this close of losing God's grace there. Think about it. Just because he was a proud commander, he was this close of losing God's grace there. Eventually he got healed, right? Just by doing what he was told to do. The biggest thing God doesn't want, uh, the biggest uh, warning that God has given to us is he hates disobedience. There is very simple instructions given to everybody, each and every one of us in our life. But disobedience, he hates it. And I'll come to the points where people who disobeyed him, what happened to it also. So, now... As soon as Naaman went into the river, started taking the shower, he first hesitated. He's like, River Jordan, that is a disgusting river. We have better rivers at my hometown, right? Where? Damascus? I don't know. There, there were a few rivers named. I, I can't remember the names. But we have better clean rivers back home. Why should I go all the way to Jordan and take the beer? I might as well do it here, right? It's interesting. Last weekend when I was walking around in Denver downtown, a colleague of mine was asking, very casual conversation, what are you, you know, so what's the plan for the weekend? And it's like a weekend, I mean, we got a few things going on. Saturday is at a friend's house, church, family. Sunday is at church, most of the day is gone in church. So most of my weekends are like that. So I don't do much, you know, this is, this is my life. Like, you know, I haven't been to a church in ages. Do you believe that you got to go to church to pray? A very tricky spot there, all of a sudden. I haven't been to church in ages. Do you believe that you got to go to church to pray? Why can't I just pray from anywhere on a Sunday? So I goes, God, now what do I say? <laughs> I wish my pastor was here with me. <laughs> pastor, you can answer. <laughs> it's your question. <laughs> I just looked around and say, you know what, you understand God is everywhere, right? I get the point, what you're trying to say is God is everywhere, so why should I go to church to pray? Why can't I pray from home, right? God is everywhere, so does air. Air is also everywhere, right? Why do you pump it in a tube or why do you pump it in a ball so that when the air is compressed and in one space, it has its value? When fellow brothers and sisters come together and pray at one place, the fellowship has value. Amen. Hallelujah. So I encouraged her that that is the reason why I go to church. I can pray anywhere. There's nothing stopping me. Air is everywhere. There's nothing stopping me from breathing. But for it to be concentrated, it has to have value. Same question is what he is also asking. Why should I go to Jordan to take a shower? I can have shower in my bath here, right here, where I am. Why I all go all the way there? It's in the, in the end of the day, it's just taking dip in the water, right? Seven times you said? Yeah, seven times I can do it. Right? But the servants urged him to go do it. He did it and he got healed. All glory goes to who? All glory goes to who? Are you sure? Not Elijah and not Elisha? All glory goes to God. Right? Can I get a praise the Lord for name and healing? Are we happy that Naaman is healed? Naaman's healing is directly related to our salvation too. How? Oh, the story keeps going, okay. The story keeps going about Ghazi, one of Elisha's uh, um, servant, you can say, or disciple, who tried to make some quick bucks on the side. Uh, you know, you know what, you got healed and all, God worked, for, uh, something for the prophet, like um, donation box. Or, um, we used to go, right? 
I, I remember when it was time for Ganpati and all, is, is all the kids used to get around and go and I used to be with them also, let's go collect some, yeah, right? Or uh, during Onam or whatever celebration that's going on and somebody, we, kids, right, we need a new cricket bat. So we just get around <laughs> with the donation box and stop people, right? Same with the so try to make some quick bucks on the side and he got money from Neyman but he did not give it to Elisha or he did not do anything. Elisha clearly said that I don't need anything. God's salvation is free. Your deliverance is free. God is a wonder working person and there is no cost for it. So your freedom is free. So I don't need anything. And then this guy Ghazi goes behind him and says, hey, you know, the prophet can say whatever he wants but you know, I'll take it. I'll, I'll give it. I'll make sure he gets it. But he didn't. He kept it to himself and hid. And then Elisha finds out in a great manner what happened. And he confronts Kasi and said only one thing. You know what? Since you stole, since you cheated, may his leprosy come over you. Not just you. You and your generation and their kids and whoever. Every they all get leprosy. What happens when you disobey, when you deceit, when you function in ways that you shouldn't be? There are consequences. All right. So that is about the story. Let's quickly wrap up, right? There are a few characters we met here. One, Naaman. Two, the king of Naaman who just sent a letter, right? Ben-Hadid. Three, the king of Israel who knew that he had everything that he needed but still didn't even believe that Elisha can do works. Forget Elisha. It's God who is making works. Israel was successful because God's hand was there. When Naaman got cured, he said only one thing. What was it? There was a total transformation. Not just bodily transformation, not just his leprosy went away, but internally also he was transformed. I'm very quickly trying to see that verse. After he came out of water, then Naaman and his attendants went... So, 14, so he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as a man of God has told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. That is the key part. That is the transformation of a heart there. And he is not boastful anymore. He is a great commander, but he is not proud anymore, thinking, why didn't even this guy come out to greet me? No, all that pride, all that everything has gone away. He is healed. He is a transformation. Internal transformation happened. There. Right? Who is Syria? And who is Israel? Israel is God's own people. God's mighty hand, the power was over Israel. And Syrians were out there. They were winning wars, that's fine, but God's hand was not over them. When the king of Israel himself did not know how much powerful God is, what does God do? God gave his grace to a Syrian guy called Naaman. Does he deserve it? No. But he was patient enough, God showed him the way. You know, that is the reason today us Gentiles have such a connection with God. That is the main reason. God is, there is a word for it, I wrote it down this morning. God is no respecter of person and the Gentiles eventually received the gospel that Israel rejected. Remember the story when Jesus was also rejected by his own people. Jesus was right there at Nazareth and the people did not even recognize him. That he is the son of God. He is the person where all the power is. And the verse goes like this. There were so many lepers in Israel, but a Syrian got healed. Why? Because Israel did not believe in the power. Israel did not see the hand of God over it. And the grace goes to a Syrian. There were so many lepers in Nazareth. When Jesus was right there. Did they see him? Did they recognize him? But God's grace doesn't stop just there. Read Acts 10, 34, 35. God shows no partiality. Or now I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. That makes the playing field level for all of us. Amen?
So today, you and I are children of God. We can sit here and worship our God. We don't have to stand outside the temple, looking at the great temple and where does my help come from. We don't have to do that anymore. We are in the temple. We are in His presence, sitting here. How great it is. There is no more Israel. There is no more Gentiles. There is no more. We all are the same. God doesn't show any favoritism. All we have to do is obey his commandments. He hates disobedience. And very simple instructions in life. Very simple instructions in life. And especially to all the people who are church builders. Our, our core, our board members and all the volunteers. And you know, not this church. I am saying in general this message is for everybody. Read Luke 27. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Luke 4.27. Mm -hmm. Titus 1.7, sorry. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gains. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. This is a message to everyone, whether you hold a position at church, whether you are a Sunday school teacher, or just a fellow standing outside, distributing pamphlets, evangelizing, whoever it is. When you are working in the name of God, remember what happened to Ghazi. We are not here to make money. God doesn't need your money. We are not here to do any of those things. Only one purpose we are here to make sure that the kingdom of God is spread around. We let the people know. Just like that servant girl. All she said that I have heard of this, right? She has spread the word. What happens beyond it is out of our control. God will work his wonders. One last verse, Numbers 32, verse 23. But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord. And you may be sure that your sin will find you out. If we fail like Ghazi did, our sin will certainly find us out. No matter what it is, we'll be thinking, uh, nobody found out. No. Eventually, it will find you out. May these words be encouraging to everyone. And I hope it's touched somebody. And keep us also in prayer. Thank you, Pastor, for the time that you gave me.